In the last episode, we saw the benefits of conceding the wave in a matchup which is quite one-sided. So now let's look at a contestable, even-ish matchup, Jax vs Renekton, which is heavily affected by who has a minion advantage and the jungle matchup. When you're contesting the wave, a lot more factors come into play. You need to compare your strength at levels 1, 2, and 3, and the jungle is irrelevant because you're attempting to push the lane and making yourself vulnerable to ganks, as opposed to conceding where you're safe from jungle ganks under your turret. Jax is relatively high on the average scale, as his level 1 is strong, but his level 2 and 3 are about average, while Renekton is solidly in the strong camp, as his level 1 and 2 are above average, and his level 3 is quite strong. If Jax manages the lane poorly, by either not getting an advantage from level 1 and 2, or not crashing the wave before Renekton's level 3 power spike, Jax will run the risk of getting chunked out by Renekton's burst and die if he tries to crash the wave while Renekton's level 3. Most players don't push their advantage in the matchup hard enough when they're stronger. Watch how Bin plays hyper aggressively on Jax to press his advantage in the matchup to get ahead at levels 1 and 2 before Renekton can hit his level 3 power spike. Here, Jax is simultaneously pushing the lane and trading, pressuring Renekton when he's going for minions and walking forward to punish Renekton's Q cooldown and push him back to get the minion advantage. By playing like a maniac and perma-trading while he's strong at level 1, Jax doesn't give Renekton the opportunity to safely get to his level 3 power spike and allow him to take over the lane. So once you have control of the wave in the early lane, the most important thing to think about is when you're going to crash the wave. You have two options, one of which is to push it slow, and the other is to push it fast. If you think you can both survive a gank and win at future levels while trying to crash the wave, then slow pushing the wave is a good option. Here, Jax knows that Lee Sin is pathing to red and will eventually gank from behind, but he knows that due to his health advantage and minion advantage, he'll be able to survive a gank. As a result, Jax pushes it slowly to give himself more opportunities to trade against Renekton before the wave crashes and before Renekton hits level 3. He can take an aggressive stance, moving forward to zone Renekton away from experience while getting the experience himself, even if they both don't get the last hits. If Jax opted to push his wave faster, then he'd be reducing the amount of time he's able to trade while he's stronger at level 1 and 2, and it would let Renekton safely get to level 3 under the turret. So now, when Lee Sin ganks, Jax is able to easily 1v2 and waste Lee Sin's time without losing anything. This also allows Shen to gain information on Lee Sin's jungle route and path accordingly to invade the blue buff while being level 3 to Lee Sin's level 2. What I want to emphasize here is that the decisions that Jax made in managing the top wave changed the course of the game for his entire team. It caused Lee Sin to alter his path to gank top which revealed his position and which camps he'd taken. It allows bot lane and mid lane to play more aggressively because they know where the jungler is when they otherwise wouldn't have known. It also allowed Shen to get a level advantage which allowed him to contest Lee Sin's blue buff. Most players gloss over the amount of impact they can have by making these types of decisions. Baiting the jungler to come top because you're slow pushing might allow your bot Leona to engage because she sees a jungler, which results in a double kill. Let's see when you might want to push the wave fast. In this example, Kiana is a champion who triples her damage at level 3, while being very weak at level 1 and kind of average at level 2. As a result, Dopa wants to play very aggressively at levels 1 and 2, and then crash this wave fully into the turret before Kiana gets level 3. Notice how TF is not afraid to trade aggressively in the early levels when Kiana is going for last hits. Many players are overly scared of trying to trade because they're a mage into an assassin. But like I said earlier, you need to push your advantage while you're stronger, because otherwise you'll let the opponent conserve too much mana and health, or give them too much gold in their first base. In a case like this, TF is at no threat of dying solo to Kiana at level 2, so the early harassment at levels 1 and 2 while you're stronger can be the difference between Kiana basing and coming back to lane with a serrated dirk and having 30% more damage, or just coming back to lane with an extra longsword. Keep in mind that while going for these trades at level 1 and 2, TF's bigger plan is to try and crash the wave fully into the turret just before Kiana gets to her level 3 power spike and triples her damage. This crash timing is also important 
because he can get the wave into the turret and retreat before the enemy jungler can be out on the map ganking him. When crashing the wave, you need to know the position of the incoming enemy minion wave so that your wave crashes before the enemy wave arrives. You can see this by looking at the position of your own incoming minion wave. TF crashes the wave in time, and now Kiana hits her level 3 spike, but he can just retreat and avoid her while losing nothing and patiently wait for the wave to push back to him. Now let's look at an example of the same matchup, but at low masters on the Chinese super server instead. Keep in mind that this is the top 0.1% of players while watching this. Notice how TF is not playing aggressively against Kiana at all. He's playing too scared when he's stronger, and he allows her to get the first three minions without taking any damage. Again, when the next set of minions are dying, Kiana's allowed to walk up and get them while only taking two autos back. You can already see that the difference between this and the previous example is night and day. TF starts to take a few more aggressive trades, but he's already allowed Kiana to get away with four more last hits than the previous example, which will allow her to get a more advantageous first base. But here's the critical error. TF didn't pay attention to the position of the incoming enemy minion wave, and now it's extremely scary for him to try and crash the wave. Kiana is now level 3, but the wave has not been fully crashed into the turret. As soon as he tries to go and push, Kiana strikes with her full combo and almost one-shots him if he didn't clutch out the exhaust. To make things worse, the wave is still not fully crashed, and Lee Sin is put behind because he has to come and help push the wave out instead of taking Scuttle. This allows Hecarim and Jax to set up for a punish, and they end up burning every summoner and feeding Kiana double buffs and a huge CS advantage. This will then allow Kiana and Hecarim to easily kill the summonerless TF when he comes back to lane and snowball the game. You can see how this one seemingly insignificant failed wave management from TF has single-handedly put the mid and top behind and doomed the entire early game which eventually snowballs into an extremely fed Kiana and Jax that snowball to carry the game. So when you're contesting the early lane, make sure you're thinking very carefully about which level spikes you're playing for and how aggressively you need to play, which levels you're trying to avoid by crashing the wave before enemy minions arrive, and how to navigate the jungle ganks. If you can manage to consistently keep all of this in mind for the first four waves, you'll see significantly fewer early deaths and you'll find playing the matchups to be a lot easier. So thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.